So good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the privilege of the podium. My name is Joshua Landrino. I'm a general surgery resident at the Cleveland Clinic. And today I'm going to be talking about Roux and Y gastric bypass versus gastrectomy with Roux and Y reconstruction treatment of gastroparesis. We have no relevant disclosures outside the scope of this presentation. Our complete disclosures are here listed. So this has been a popular topic so far, so I'll just uh, keep this very brief. Uh, gastroparesis is a, a debilitating functional disorder of the stomach characterized by objective delays and gastric emptying absent mechanical obstruction. It is a uh, growing and significant clinical concern in the United States, uh, much due to the uh, uh, increase in the incidence of diabetes, uh, which is, of course, one of the, the classically defined ideologies of gastroparesis, uh, including diabetes, post-surgical, and idiopathic. So uh, initial treatment of gastroparesis relies on lifestyle and di dietary modifications with or without prokinetic or antimetic medications, but fortunately these can be associated with significant side effects and they may lose their efficacy over time. F for those who fail this initial management and uh, are deemed medically refractory, there are several surgical options that exist, such as placement of enteral access, gastrointestinal stimulators, Pyloristrected therapies include pyloroplasty and its endoscopic corollaries, uh, parole pyloromyotomy pop. Uh, and then finally, for those who fail all else, uh, total gastrectomy, ruin wide gastric bypass. And today I'm going to focus on the, the latter. So, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of data regarding either of these procedures for the treatment of gastroparesis. And to our knowledge, there are no comparative studies comparing bypass with gastrectomy, as was alluded to in this, the previous presentation, there is concern with bypass that you're leaving behind a non-draining remnant stomach. Uh, so we wish to explore what to do with it, whether it resect or bypass the disease organ with a focus on period of outcome, symptom improvement, and need for subsequent interventions. All patients at our institution from uh, December 10 to March 18, uh, undergoing bypass or near total gastrectomy with gastrojunal anastomosis uh, were included only, uh, importantly, only those with a primary indication for gastroparesis. This is not patients uh, who underwent bypass as a, as a metabolic procedure. Um, we excluded these patients as well as patients with previous gastric resection. And for the purpose of this talk, I, I use a uh, room-wide gastric bypass, but again, not as a metabolic procedure. It's not for weight loss. The root limb is typically 75 to 100 centimeters. So we, we found 26 patients undergoing gastric bypass and 27 with neurocodal gastrectomy in the study period uh, with a mean age of around 49 years. Unsurprisingly, based on epidemiology, most patients were female, but they were slightly more in the Rune Y cohort. The uh, mean BMI preoperatively was also slightly higher in, on, for patients undergoing bypass at 34 versus 29. The etiology of gastroparesis was similar in the two cohorts. There were slightly more in the gastrectomy group uh, whose etiology was post-surgical, slightly more in bypass to idiopathic gastroparesis, but there was no statistical difference. Preoperative symptoms were also very similar in the two groups. Uh, most patients complained of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, and there are no differences preoperatively. Patients undergoing gastrectomy were more likely to have had previous gastroparesis-related interventions. Uh, most of this was due to previous enteral access tube, either gastrostomy or surgical jejunostomy tube placement. There were also patients included who had failed gastric stimulators, uh, endoscopic pyloric Botox injections, and laparoscopic endoscopic myotomies. Each case was initially uh, attempted with minimally invasive approach. However, three of the gastrectomy patients were converted to open due to dense adhesions. The operative time was significantly longer in the uh, subtotal gastrectomy cohort as was the estimated blood loss. Patients undergoing near total gastrectomy were more likely to have complications in with, within uh, 30 days. Uh, there were four reoperations in this, this group, two negative diagnostic laparoscopies, one uh, for an evacuation of uh, intra-abdominal access and placement of drains and one lysis adhesions for early post-operative obstruction. There was one mortality in both cohorts. Both of these were due to cardiopulmonary arrest, uh, which occurred at home after discharge uh, at two and three weeks post-operatively. 
the patients undergoing a hysterectomy were also much more likely to be readmitted within 30 days of discharge uh, compared to bypass. So at uh, a similar duration of follow-up between the two groups, patients undergoing a hysterectomy were much more likely to require subsequent uh, surgical intervention either related to the primary procedure or for uh, progression of gastroparesis. Most of this was due to the significant difference in the patients needing subsequent enteral access in the bypass cohort, uh, whether uh, draining gastrostomy or jejunostomy feeding tube. Um, also included for bypass, uh, one patient required a remnant gastrectomy who was subsequent symptomatic improvement. One patient in each cohort did go on to have intestinal transplant for progression to, to global dysmotility. The post-operative symptoms uh, seemingly inc uh, improved in both cohorts, uh, particularly the nausea and vomiting at six months. Uh, the preoperative values are showed uh, in, in parentheses. Uh, there was no difference in symptomatic change between the two procedures. And this improvement in symptoms did persist at the 12-month follow-up time point uh, across all the symptoms that were assessed. Again, there were no difference in the two procedures. And then finally, we contacted these patients to get uh, some sort of objective measure of symptoms using the gastroparesis cardinal symptom index done at uh, a median 38 and 19 months postoperatively uh, to assess the current state uh, of symptoms. There were no differences uh, between the two approaches uh, in any of the subdomains or overall GC size score. So we do, we do certainly recognize several limitations of the study. Uh, not least its retrospective nature. Uh, this was, these were all done at a tertiary referral center, which I mean, these patients were complex. Um, so the experience, particularly with complications, they may uh, even be better in a more general setting. And then finally, we had limited objective symptomatic data preoperatively uh, impulsed, including things like GCSI or other quality of life measures. But uh, according to our data, we, we did find some increase in the perioperative morbidity with neutral gastrectomy compared to bypass. They had equivalent symptomatic improvement uh, at follow-up, but the patients that are going bypass were much more likely to require additional interventions. So we concluded that while it may be associated with great morbidity, gastrectomy could potentially be seen as a more definitive intervention for fractured gastroparesis. Thank you very much.